Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Reentry Initiative Learning Collaborative session number two. We're really excited to have you here with us this morning. Uh, we have a very packed agenda, and we're excited to also be bringing on some guests from um, county partners from Santa Clara and Yuba County. Um, wanted to remind folks before we jump into the session that we are recording these sessions. We will make the recording, the transcript, and the materials available to all participants uh, following the meeting. We will also post the materials to the DHCS website within 7 to 10 days um, so that folks can go back and review the materials or share it with colleagues that were unable to participate in today's session. Uh, we also wanted to remind folks that your microphones are muted while presenters are speaking. There will be opportunities for interaction throughout today's events, and we look forward to hearing all of your comments and questions as we go throughout the day. Please use the question and answer feature in the Zoom webinar um, to be able to ask your questions directly, and we'll make sure that we're answering those throughout. Um, and we will be rolling out frequently asked questions based on these sessions following the session so that everybody has the benefit of seeing all of the responses to questions that have been posed during these learning collaborative sessions. So I'm um, really excited to uh, get into the content for today, and we'll start off by going to the next slide. And the next one after that. So I think uh, you all, if you participated last time or have been in other meetings with us or familiar with our Justice Involved team here at DHCS, my name is Autumn Boylan. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Strategic Partnerships. We have other team members uh, from the Office of Strategic Partnerships here with us today, including Sydney Armanderas. Uh, who's our branch chief, Greg Tate and Luana Welch, who are section chiefs, Michael Gillis, Mike Hedin, and Megan Shandell are our unit chiefs. And then we have lots of staff that are also supporting this effort um, underneath these teams. And uh, we all introduced ourselves last time, so we won't spend the time doing that today. But as our team members uh, join in the presentation today, we'll make sure to reintroduce ourselves. We do want to make sure that you are familiar with our colleagues with the Managed Care Eligibility Division as well. So we'll, um, on the next page, you see kind of the structure of that um, organization with DHCS. And we do have folks who are gonna be joining us for the presentation today. So um, we will ask Sarah to go ahead and do a quick introdu introduction uh, of yourself since you'll be presenting content today um, and let folks know about MCED. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Linder. I am a section chief within our eligibility division. My team is primarily responsible for all of the pre-release application processes and policies. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. We also manage our Medi-Cal inmate eligibility programs at the county and state level and oversee policy for individuals that are incarcerated while on Medi-Cal. Um, as you see, we have some of our other leadership on the screen uh, listed there. Um, William White is our branch chief, Sarah Crow is the division chief, and we report to Renee Mallow, our deputy director. Thanks, Adam. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, couldn't do this work without the partnership of our internal colleagues, and um, our eligibility division plays a critical role um, in the, shaping the policy and operational procedures for this program. So we appreciate you joining us in today's conversation. Um, on the next page, we would like to uh, get to know you and who all is with us participating during today's session. So we are going to ask you to um, answer a quick poll. It should have popped up on your screen and let us know who's here in the um, in the space with us today. Um, it's really important that we understand kind of the audience that we're reaching so we can tailor our conversation and also make sure that we know who we're not reaching so that we can better engage and make sure folks are, um, are, are um, you know, aware of the opportunity of these learning collaborative sessions. So it looks like about... Uh, 
seventeen percent of or so of our uh, panel or of our attendees today are representing county jails, eight percent representing county youth correctional facilities, uh, twenty six percent representing our county behavioral health agencies, um, fourteen percent uh, from our managed care plans. Uh, we also have some ECM providers, county social services and our California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation represented. So glad to see you all here today. Um, looking forward to continuing our dialogue and thank you all so much for participating in the survey today. Um, okay, next page. So just want to quickly um, recap and reiterate um, the learning collaborative timeline and kind of what you can expect from this series of learning collaborative sessions over the course of the next couple of months. Uh, of course, on August 22nd, we did our kickoff session where we provided a ton of really important information about the Medi-Cal provider enrollment processes, um, as well as the Medi-Cal program in general, and where you can go to find information about claiming, about trainings that are coming up related to billing and claiming, and other information that's critical to implementing the Justice Involved or Reentry Initiative. Uh, we also did hold an office hour session on August 29th, and we had lots of folks uh, come to participate in a lot of questions out of the office hour session um, to continue the conversation. Um, but one of the things that we kind of learned through the process of this initial session um, kickoff and office hour is that we want to create more space and opportunity for county partners from the county correctional health care services delivery system uh, to really come together and problem solve together. And so we've decided to add a separate office hour session that will be specifically for our county correctional health care services partners, whether that's county sheriff or probation or county health services public health, whichever of the county entities are responsible for the provision of pre-release services will be invited to attend the Correctional Facility Office Hour Session. That Office Hour Session will take place um, in the week following the learning session, and then we will, the week following that, have a general Office Hour Sessions where all of our implementing partners are welcome to attend and ask questions either about the content from the prior session or about, uh, excuse me, or about, um, you know, just what's top of mind for you for the reentry initiative. And so we really want to kind of create space for our county partners, make sure that folks are getting their questions answered so that they can implement these initiatives, and then make sure that we're also offering space to our other implementing partners um, who can come together and ask questions as well. So uh, we are adding an office hour session and we'll um, continue to adjust because this is a learning collaborative, not just for all of you, but for us as well. So we wanna make sure that we are also learning from this process about what works uh, best to disseminate information, to engage you all in dialogue and to obtain your feedback about, um, this, uh, about this program. We also wanted to remind you about the trainings that are upcoming for the JI screening portal um, and for billing training. Uh, we are going to talk about the JI screening portal today, um, but the discussion today is really about kind of the policy behind the screening portal and the expectations for how the screening portal will be used um, uh, to facilitate the 90 days of pre-release services. Uh, we'll also kind of go into some of the pause and reset scenarios to make sure folks are tracking how to use the JI screening portal from a policy and programmatic perspective. The training on September 10th and September 12th will be more technical in nature and will show folks what the portal actually looks like. Um, and sorry, you could go back to the other slide, what the portal actually looks like and um, and how to actually interface with the portal. So that 
that's a more of a, a technical training that'll be coming up and it'll be an important complement to what we're talking about today. And then the billing trainings on uh, the 17th and 19th of September um, will be sessions that are focused on how you submit claims within the Medi-Cal context and um, and other considerations for uh, for claiming within the Medi-Cal program. So uh, really looking forward to that. And then we'll continue our discussion in the learning collaborative sessions on September 26th and October 17th um, with topics on behavioral health services and non-behavioral health services. So we encourage you to continue participating. Next slide. Last time we got together with you all and talked about the collective working norms for this learning collaborative. And we did get a lot of feedback um, on the working norms. We did make some slight revisions, but a lot of the feedback that we received about the working norms was specifically around, you know, how we all want to come together. And a lot of the responses from session one, for example, emphasized the need to remain focused on a person-centered approach um, to delivering the pre-release services and, um, and transition services for transition back into the community and re-entry. Um, so we 100% agree with that, with that person-centered approach, and um, and can and agree that that should be part of our collective working norms. As a matter of fact, as you think about what remaining mission-driven is all about, is is really that piece about focusing on our members and making sure that we're providing a quality of care to our members and supporting their transition from the carceral setting back into the community. We also um, got a lot of responses about the role of the learning collaborative for gathering and sharing information on best practices for encouraging individuals to participate in the programs. So we um, were able to uh, you know, get a lot of feedback on that. And that's exactly the point of the learning collaborative spaces. And today we're going to use our breakout sessions to have county partners come together to really start to identify those best practices and have some peer learning for each other within the context of this learning collaborative environment. So it's not just about you all coming here to learn from DHCS and our partners, but also for you all to learn from each other and identify those best practices. Uh, lastly, we got a, a few uh, responses from attendees noting the report in, uh, importance of being responsive to all of the different stakeholder types and acknowledging the value of input from a variety of stakeholders. And we've tried to stay true to that throughout our engagement process. This space of the learning collaborative does include multiple cross-sector partners who are coming together to successfully implement the reentry initiative. And as I just said a moment ago, we're, see we're thinking about how we seek opportunities to maximize input and involvement of our various stakeholder um, stakeholder uh, types so that we can make sure that we're getting input from all sectors and um, and that there's an opportunity for folks to uh, effectively collaborate together. Um, so uh, these were great suggestions. I believe that uh, Christian put the mirror boards in the chat if you'd like to continue to um, add to the working norms or comment on what we've presented here. We invite you to do so by clicking on the mirror board for uh, for your last name. So it's you know alphabetized based on your last name uh, in order to make sure that everybody can access the mirror boards. But if you have additional content, please do uh, go ahead and um, and share that. Next. I already talked a little bit about the recap of what we talked about last time, but just as a reminder in a, a little bit more detail, and again, these recordings um, and transcripts are are, um, are available for, um, for all of you to kind of go back and reflect to, or if you missed the session, uh, you can access the recording and the content as well. Um, but last time we really kind of talked about the goals of the learning collaborative and then working norms as we just discussed. We did a deep dive into the reentry initiative and kind of the goals of the initiative and why we're all here doing this work. 
Uh, we've provided an overview of Medi-Cal requirements and provider enrollment expectations, including that our county correctional facility partners enroll with the Department of Healthcare Services through our PEEV system as exempt from licensure clinic as well as the requirement for ordering, referring, and prescribing practitioners with an existing enrollment pathway or, or providers with an existing enrollment pathway to enroll in the Medi-Cal program through our PAVE portal as well. And so really important information that's critical to um, go live that we suggest you revisit if you miss the information or need uh, to uh, hear it again, uh, the recordings available. We also had regional breakout sessions where we collected additional stakeholder feedback about the collaboration process and how it's been going so far at the local level um, in terms of the collaboration between our Medi-Cal managed care plans, our county uh, correctional facility partners, and our county behavioral health agency partners. And then really kind of walked through the, um, the policy initiatives that are the highest priority based on stakeholder feedback and kind of the process that we'll go through as part of this learning collaborative to be able to address um, those policy issues that are coming up over and over again. So that was a really um, great session that we had last time. We hope that you found it helpful if you were participating in the last session, and we look forward to um, hearing your feedback if you're just getting acquainted uh, with the recording um, and seeing the session for the first time. Next. For today, we're going to get into the screening portal that is required to be used by correctional facility partners uh, to indicate that the member has been screened and is eligible for the pre-release services to activate the aid code um, and to track the release date so that we have um, a tracking mechanism for the 90 days of pre-release services. So we're really going to di uh, dig into the policy behind that, the reasons why the portal was created and, and what you can expect from the portal. And then again, the technical training on how to use the portal will uh, be out starting next week on the 10th and the 12th. And, um, and that's really a complement to the information that we're providing today. We're also going to talk about the aid code pause, restart, and reset scenarios. Um, we'll talk about the short-term model requirements and best practices, and then we'll hear from our panelists and colleagues from Santa Clara County and Yuba County um, who are getting ready to go live on October 1, and they'll share kind of what they've been thinking about in terms of implementing the reentry initiative in their county jail systems and youth correctional facilities. And then we'll have a breakout session session where we will invite you all to talk to each other. And again, it's not really a time for you to learn from us. We'll be there to help facilitate the conversation, but the breakout sessions are really an opportunity for our county partners to come together and learn from each other in a peer learning environment. So you see the objectives for today, and we'll go ahead and dig in now um, to the content for today's session. Next. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Linder, Linder who is going to um, walk through the JI screening portal. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Good morning. And next slide. Thank you. Um, before we get into discussing eligibility and activating the JI aid code, it's important for us to highlight the first step in this process, which is really enrolling individuals in Medi-Cal and or confirming their enrollment and reporting their incarceration to the social services department. So many of you that are familiar with me have probably been hearing this for over the last two years now, but as of January 1, 2023, the cal -AIM Justice Initiative requires every county to establish a pre-release Medi-Cal application process to ensure that incarcerated individuals can access Medi-Cal services upon release and also to ensure that they're eligible to access the 90-day pre-release services. This process should ideally begin at intake or within 135 days of an individual's known release date. This allows us time to ensure that the application is processed and they're able to access services when they re-enter the community. This step is key to really implementing the Justice Involved Reentry Initiative as individuals um, within this program must be enrolled in Medi-Cal. 
As part of this process, the county correctional facilities and social services departments must work together to facilitate the enrollment of individuals and youth in Medi-Cal. And this mandate also requires counties develop ongoing communication processes around the enrollment and verification of, of Medi-Cal, as well as the suspension of benefits as required by state law. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the JI screening portal, um, the portal was created to record the screening outcomes, manage the JI aid code for qualifying individuals, and to streamline pre-release services by ensuring timely communication between correctional facilities and DHCS. The portal will allow facilities or their designated staff to confirm if an individual is enrolled in Medi-Cal or CHIP, to report the health care screening outcomes for pre-release eligibility. And if the individual is not already enrolled in Medi-Cal, the portal will alert the facility to initiate a pre-release Medi-Cal application. For individuals that are enrolled in Medi-Cal, the portal will then activate the JI aid code granting access for pre-release services and sending a notice of action as applicable. For ineligible individuals or individuals that have been determined not to qualify for the program, they will receive a denial notice. Next slide, please. As outlined in our policy and operations guide, correctional facilities must screen all Medi-Cal eligible individuals to determine if they meet the health criteria for pre-release services, reporting the qualifying condition. Youth, however, are automatically eligible for pre-release services without needing to meet the health criteria. For this program, youth are defined as those under 21 or former foster youth between the ages of 18 and 26, regardless if they're housed in a youth facility or county jail. So we'll kind of walk through what this will look like as an example. And so on here in our first tier one screening, um, it's expected that this would occur about within 96 hours of booking. So the facilities should assess immediate physical and behavioral health needs, verify Medi-Cal enrollment or start that application process, and then screen for pre-release services. Health Criteria can be confirmed through self-attestation from the member or by utilizing past medical records. If this can't be done within 96 hours, screening should occur during the comprehensive health screening within the first two weeks of the incarceration. However, clinicians may also identify eligibility at any point during the individual's care within the facility. So tier two on our screen kind of outlines that within two weeks, period of time, and then the last um, column on the screen will identify ongoing screening that may occur. The correctional facility will use this information and the individual's release date to determine when the screening outcome should be reported through the JI screening portal to activate or otherwise turn on the aid code. Our short-term model will be discussed a little bit later in this webinar, and it'll kind of speak to instances in which individuals do not have a known release date. Next slide, please. The screening for pre-release services will look a little bit different in prisons. Of course, these individuals um, incarcerated in prison have significantly longer incarceration periods, and they typically undergo comprehensive assessments before the 90-day pre-release period begins. Screening for Medi-Cal and pre-release service eligibility would be done well before the 90-day period, usually around 180 to 135 days before release to allow the member to receive the full 90-day period of benefit. This also accounts for the necessary 45 to 90 days required for a Medi-Cal application to be completed. Similar to county corrections, prison staff may reference medical records to determine if an individual meets the health criteria to qualify for pre-release services. And similarly, the re results of those screenings should be entered into the JI screening portal to establish eligibility for the program. Next slide, please. All right, now we know how we determine if someone's eligible, but 
how, what information is required for the JI screening portal to be able to look someone up or manage their eligibility? So to manage an incarcerated Medi-Cal member's eligibility in the JI screening portal, correctional agencies must use key information about the member, their Medi-Cal client identification number or their SIN number, and the member's date of birth. These two were used to confirm their Medi-Cal enrollment and manage eligibility for pre-release services. The JI pre-release aid code may only be activated for individuals who are already enrolled in Medi-Cal or CHIP. To activate the aid code, the agency must provide the expected release date if known and the qualifying health condition or indicate the member is a youth. The member's SIN number can be obtained through DHCS's eligibility verification system or by working with social services during the pre-release application process. As you see on the screen there, we've listed the qualifying physical or behavioral health conditions. Um, and also in the portal, it'll have an, an indication for youth, which would not require one of those conditions to be met. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna get into how we track the 90-day period and um, the rules around doing so. Thank you. The demonstration effort um, that DHCS has been approved for limits the payment of pre-release services for an individual medic for an incarcerated Medi-Cal member to only a 90-day period prior to their release. Um, and for a little bit of background, Medi-Cal generally uses what are called aid codes to identify an individual's enrollment within a specific Medi-Cal program and to assist Medi-Cal providers in identifying the types of services a Medi-Cal member is eligible for. So in following that, DHCS developed a JI aid code series. So we have five different JI aid codes that are gonna be used to identify individuals eligible for pre-release services. The JI screening portal will also be used by DHCS to track the number of days pre-release services have been provided to a member to identify when they're at the end of their 90-day period or to help determine if the JI aid code qualifies for pausing, reset, or restart. Next slide, please. So a little bit um, about our aid code. So as we've highlighted thus far, the JI aid code will be activated for only those who qualify for a pre-release program. And the JI screening portal is really the tools for correctional facilities or their designated staff to use to activate, terminate, pause, reset, or restart the JI aid code. Based on the screening outcomes reported by the correctional facilities, appropriate approval or denial notices will be issued for the Medi-Cal member. The focus on this slide is really to, to help determine the timing for which the aid code should be activated. For individuals with known releases, the aid code should be activated 90 days prior to the expected release date or as soon as possible if the release date is less than 90 days. For individuals with unknown release dates, the JI aid code should also be activated as soon as possible. Our recommendation is as close to intake um, and once the Medi-Cal has been validated. And this is to ensure that the correctional facility is able to provide available services prior to the release in alignment with the short-term model, which we'll get more into shortly. All right. I'm going to now pass it over to Ashley Delly, who's going to walk through some of the policy related to the 90-day um, aid code. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Delly. I am a member of the Office of Strategic Partnerships team, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So we are going to get started with some terminology this morning. So this slide defines a few key terms related to the management of a member's eligibility in the JI screening portal. Uh, as seen on the slide, pause is defined as the temporary stoppage of pre-release services. Reset is the start of a new set of 90-day pre-release services. Restart is the restart of the remaining days within a set of 90-day pre-release services. Uh, that term pre-release benefits 
essentially are the services that eligible JI individuals will, re will receive during the 90 day period prior to their release. Qualifying events are events that warrant the need for a pause and depending on the scenario, a reset or restart will follow. We will explore a few examples soon. Next slide, please. Okay, when to update the JI portal during the 90 day pre-release service period. On this slide, you will see a few examples of qualifying events that warrant the need for a pause. Correctional facilities will pause the JI aid code via the JI screening portal to ensure that pre-release services are unable to be reimbursed using Medi-Cal funding during that time. In the first example, an individual is found incompetent to stand trial is, and is transferred to a state hospital. In the next example, you'll see an individual's release date is unexpectedly extended or delayed. This can occur for a variety of reasons. In each of these pause examples, a reset or restart may apply. We will uh, discuss a few examples of an, when a reset or restart applies shortly. Next slide, please. All right, when to reset or restart the 90 day pre-release service period after a pause. We're going to discuss those differences between a reset and restart and how they apply. After an initial pause, an individual may qualify to have one reset, which as we defined earlier, is a new set of 90 days of pre-release services, regardless of how many days were previously utilized. I did want to highlight that youth members are not subject to the same reset parameters as other members. In the example on the slide, a youth begins receiving pre-release services prior to their court date and expected release date. If the discharge recommendation is not approved by the judge and the youth member returns to the facility for additional time, the youth correctional facility can reset the 90 days of pre-release services prior to, the prior to the next discharge hearing. Now we're gonna talk about restart. There may be circumstances in which an individual, an individual receiving a second period of up to 90 days of pre-release services experiences additional qualifying events requiring additional pauses within that same incarceration. A restart of benefits occurs after a reset has already been received. As a reminder, a restart is defined as restarting the number of remaining days within a set of 90 days of pre-release services. Once that additional set of 90 days has been utilized, no additional restarts will be permitted, um, regardless if the individual experiences another qualifying event. Next slide, please. This slide, we're gonna highlight the importance of updating the JI screening portal. Once activated, the JI aid code is set to run for 90 days if no release date is entered, or until the expected release date, whichever is shorter, if that release date is entered. If no release date is entered, it is important that CFs or their designees update the JI screening portal once a release date is identified or if there is any change to that release date. In addition, the JI screening portal must be updated if a qualifying event occurs. Otherwise, the JI aid code will auto terminate impacting the correctional facility's ability to bill for pre-release services and ultimately impacts the member's eligibility period. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna, uh, on the next few slides, we're gonna um, walk through some uh, scenarios. We're gonna start with uh, our first reset scenario. So if you take a look at the screen here, the screen here, we see that um, Kim is incarcerated at a women's facility, right? She has a current uh, expected release date of March 31st. Uh, during that time, uh, this correctional facility confirms that Kim is enrolled in Medi-Cal. They enter Kim's Medi-Cal eligibility, excuse me, her GI pre-release uh, screening eligibility uh, and status into that GI screening portal, as well as that release date. This will activate that 90-day uh, aid code, right, prior to her release. 
Um, as a result, she begins receiving those pre-release services uh, 90 days prior to her release. Uh, during that time period, uh, a qualifying event occurs. Uh, Kim's release date is postponed by six months to June 30th. So now the correctional facility will go into that JI screening portal, update the new release date, and hence that uh, results in a pause to the aid code. So closer to the new uh, release date, 90 days prior to the new release date, um, the JI aid code is uh, reapplied to Kim and her 90 day period is reset because she has only experienced one pause. So now she's gonna get that reset. And that is gonna grant her uh, a new set of 90 days of services. Uh, during that time, um, billing for Medi-Cal, billing Medi-Cal for pre-release services uh, resumes as it normally would. On June 30th, uh, Kim is released. And because the uh, actual release date aligns with what was entered in the JI screening portal, um, there is no further action needed in the uh, JI screening portal at this time. So this is an example of a reset scenario. Next slide, please. This is a second example of a reset scenario. This individual is currently incarcerated in Sacramento County Jail. Uh, his, he's incarcerated on February 28th. Um, by March 1st, uh, the correctional facility confirms that Joe is enrolled in Medi-Cal and he enters his um, eligibility information um, into that JI screening portal. Unfortunately, in this case, Joe does not have a release date. So the correctional facility is not able to enter that information into the JI screening portal. However, uh, the JI screening portal um, will activate that JI aid code based on the effective date entered. So the correctional facility is going to follow that short-term model and pre-release services will begin on March 2nd. On March 8th, Joe is found to be incompetent to stand trial and he's transferred to a mental, uh, excuse me, a state hospital for a mental health assessment. Uh, the correctional facility will then update the screening portal with that qualifying event so that a pause can occur to the aid code. Joe will return to jail on April 15th. Um, as a result, uh, correctional facility will enter jo Joe's new effective date into the, the port JI screening portal. That JI aid code is reapplied. And because his benefits, again, were never paused previously, this is that first pause, his benefits will be reset and he will receive a new set of 90 days of pre-release services. And following that, uh, billing will uh, presume as it normally would. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna talk about a restart scenario. So in this scenario, you're gonna see there's multiple qualifying events um, resulting in a reset and a restart. So Terry is incarcerated at one of the state prisons with a release date of July 31st. And during that time, he's denied parole, parole excuse me, and receives a new release date. Because Terry has already had one reset, the, the correctional facility restarts his benefits when a behavioral incident occurs. So let's talk about that. So he's incarcerated at the prison. His expected release date is July 31st. Um, his eligibility for Medi-Cal, he's confirmed to be Medi-Cal eligible. The information is entered into the JI screening portal. Uh, the, the correctional facility will begin those pre-release services uh, 90 days prior to jo uh, Terry's release. Um, during that time period, there's a qualifying event where Terry is denied parole and receives a new release date. So the correctional facility will go into that JI screening portal, uh, uh, basically activate that pause, excuse me there. And then following that, um, because his, again, his benefits were just received that one pause, we're gonna go ahead and um, when we reapply, when, he, when we, we can do that first reset and he'll get a new uh, 90 days of services, right? So August 8th, the services are reset um, and billing presumes as normal. Now we're gonna get into where he, a second qualifying event occurs. So uh, Terry has a behavioral incident um, that occurs uh, mid-August 
And as a result, his release date is postponed. So now we're having another postponement of a release date, which is a qualifying event. So the correctional facility staff is going to go in and update that JI screening portal uh, and set it to pause. Uh, closer to that new release date, uh, the JI aid code needs to once again be reactivated. However, um, it's not going to be reset a second time. Instead, Terry is going to experience a restart. So based on what was utilized during that second period, um, he still has remaining 74 days. And so as a result, when he gets that restart following that second qualifying event, um, he will have access to 74 days versus the 90 days of pre-release services. And then billing will occur um, as it usually does. I'm just gonna pause for a moment and then we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, we're gonna go ahead now and move on to the live Q&A portion of the presentation. Uh, DHCS will respond to live questions uh, for the next 10 minutes, as you can see on this slide. Um, at this time, if there is a question that you would like to ask, you may raise your hand um, our team will call upon speakers and re request for you to come off mute. And then at that point, you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. And if you prefer not to do that, um, we do encourage you to continue to use that Q&A feature uh, to share feedback or ask questions. And I thank you for your time today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause at this time. All right. Thank you so much, Ashley and Sarah. Um, great job. I think that is really important information. Um, we'll go ahead and take questions so folks can raise your hands and we'll do our best to answer them live. There may be some questions that we need to take back um, or that we're not prepared to answer. So we'll say that, but we'll answer as many questions as we can. And our first hand is from Tyler Maines. Hi, um, thank you. Um, so Tyler Maines, San Francisco. Two questions. Um, one, is it going to be possible to do bulk uploads to the JI portal? For example, we use Epic in our jail facility. And so I'm imagining we could create an Epic report with all eligible patients in the information and then get that into an Excel file or something and upload to the JI portal. Uh, and then second question, in the jail setting, since uh, we won't know release dates, um, would it be reasonable to automatically put every, I'm imagining this bulk upload, to put everyone's expected release date as basically 90 days from the date of arrest? Because if I'm understanding correctly, if they get released before the 90 days, then we don't have to do any of the pause, restart uh, stuff, and they'll just get released and be eligible for services during their entire time in custody. Thanks for the questions, Tyler. Um, I think I'll start and then team Ashley or Sarah, if you want to jump in. Um, I, I know for the JI screening portal that's going live on October 1st, um, it does not include bulk upload functionality. Um, it's a, more of a, a manual process for individual um, individuals. Uh, individual, individual, sorry about that, but but uh, we are looking at building in that functionality and working with our system partners to make that available for bulk uploads in the future iterations of the screening portal. We have heard feedback that that would make the workflow a little bit easier to manage at this time. Um, that functionality will not be live. Sarah or Ashley, anything that I said that incorrect or you want to fix for the record? No, that's correct. It's our intent to get there, but at this time we don't have that functionality available. Um, and then the second question about whether you should just put the release date as 90 days, we would not like you to do that. We would like you to put actual release dates when known. Um, and if not known, um, then you know that's understood. You can go back and update the portal when the information is known. Um, but we don't want you to just kind of predict that it'll be 90 days. In some cases, it'll be two days. In some cases, it'll be 10. And not everybody will be expected to be incarcerated for a period of 90 days. So we'd prefer that you update the portal with accurate information about known release dates. 
Um, I would just add to that, but to your point, Tyler, if you're adding, if you're activating someone under the short-term model, you don't have a release date known, the system is going to automatically set that termination date 90 days out. We'll kind of get into that a little bit. And then at that point, if there is a change or if they meet a quali or if they have a qualifying event, such as that change, um, then they can be paused or whatever. So without a known release date, it's auto going to set it to that 90 days. And then, like Autumn said, the county would be responsible for going in and, and managing that as more information is known. Thanks for thanks for correcting the record there. But but the yeah, the overall point is we do want you to be more precise when that information is known. Heather? Lauer? Lauer? Okay. Is it hi, thank you, Autumn. So my question is about the expectation of services between those 90 day periods. So say in your example, the person had started their 90 day pre-release services and then had a reset, and then later on had a restart. So some services had started during those non 90 day periods, what would be the expectation of the quality of, of, of services that should be continued? Because they would have started services and then you're going to stop the 90 day period. Stopping services sometimes is is not beneficial. Yeah. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, this this program is really about a partnership between um, between the Medi-Cal program and um, and correctional facilities who already have an obligation to provide healthcare services as appropriate to uh, to your incarcerated in individuals. Um, I would say that, yeah, I think you need to manage the um, a per have a person centered approach and determine what is needed and really the eligibility um, discussion about pausing and resetting and the 90 days of pre release is really about uh, what's eligible for reimbursement under the federal Medicaid program um, and our 1115 waiver. So we're not, we would not advise you to stop providing services to somebody who needs them. That's different from whether the correctional facility can be reimbursed for those services. It can be reimbursed for 90 days, unless there's a reset um, of covered services for eligible members. All right, James Tompkins. Hey, everybody. Um, so quick question. Some of our facilities have different uh, staff needs and abilities. So when delivering these services, uh, one of the main concerns is continuity of care and the ability to deliver the services. So for institutions that don't have the, the staff to meet those needs, can they contract with ECMs to come and deliver those services with the exception of the billing and then the processes themselves? But as far as meeting, um, creating plans, things of that nature. Correctional facilities can contract with community-based providers. Um, if you contract with community-based providers to deliver care on behalf of the correctional facility, they would be considered an embedded provider because they're acting as part of that contract and working on behalf of the correctional facility. You can also authorize community-based providers to provide in-reach services, whereby you do not have a contract with them, but you allow them to either come into the facility and provide services or provide services via telehealth, and then they would bill for those services as fee-for-service providers in the Medi-Cal system. Beautiful, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Cassandra Costa. You're on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'm with Imperial County Sheriff's Office, and one of the, the questions that I have is regarding the JI portal. With the the Eves, Aves that is the Medi-Cal portal that we're supposed to be using for the correctional facility to access the Medi-Cal status is are those two systems going to be working together or are we using the, that Medi-Cal system first to identify their status and then putting them into the JI portal? Or what, what would be the you know, perspective process with those two systems? 
Sarah, do you want to take that one? Yeah. So that's actually a really good question, Cassandra. And the, the JI portal is actually going to be on that same Medi-Cal provider portal website. So it's all going to be there. Um, it depends on the timing, really. Um, we recommend using the eligibility verification system, and that was really kind of to help support the pre-release services prior to the portal being available to us, and it gives a little bit more information about whether or not the benefits are suspended. So we would still recommend if you have that process built in at or near intake to validate someone as enrolled in Medi-Cal, you can continue using that. The JI screening portal will also be able to do that validation, but you'll need to have the SIN number and the date of birth available to you to be able to query and validate that they're enrolled through the screening portal. Whereas the eligibility verification system, the EVS provider side of things will allow the social security number, the benefit identification number and other methods for validating or verifying eligibility. So we're not going to be um, kind of removing access to EVS as part of um, pre-release applications, that'll still be available to support, but the counties will really be able to determine the business processes that fit within your organization and the processes you already have established to determine how you'll use either tool. Does that answer your question? Okay, Sharon Post. Hi, um, I'm from Sonoma County Sheriff's Office, and I had a question about your second scenario with the um, individual who's incompetent to stand trial, and so, and they leave the facility, and so they would be paused. Um, but we we have a jail-based competency treatment program in the facility, and I'm wondering if the key here is that the person was not in our facility or whether it's also tied to competence. So if they're participating in our JBCT program and competency may be restored in, I mean, we never know exactly, you know, obviously ahead of time, but, you know, say it was going to be, they may be restored in 50 days. We wouldn't is there some expectation that they would be paused because they're incompetent to stand trial? Is it because they're IST or is it strictly? No, the, the scenario that was shared today during the webinar is really about the transfer from the jail facility to the state hospital, necessitating the pause in the aid code. I will say, and uh, somebody else asked this question in the chat as well. I will say that, um, you know, it is the intent of the reentry initiative to facilitate uh, reentry back into the community from the carceral setting, and the 90 days of pre-release are meant to uh, serve that purpose of facilitating reentry. So as long as the, that purpose is being fulfilled, there's no reason to pause the services. Um, you know, if if it's if the is the case for that uh, for a particular individual that it's not likely that they would be released within the 90 day period, then we would want you to kind of think about when it's appropriate to pause and um, and and maybe restart once uh, once that individual gets closer to an actual release date. So that that's more the scenario that you take into consideration is like, when is the actual release date for that individual? It's not their status as I, uh, as IST. OK, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, we're going to do two more questions, um, and then we'll go on to the session. Um, Larissa Harin. Hi, I'm with um, San Luis Obispo County Probation, and I'm curious about the. <clears throat> so we have a program within our juvenile facility where youth are ordered in for a year, and then they have the opportunity to earn credit off of that time. So an so the official release date that's on record from the court is very likely to be inaccurate and an estimated release date is going to be more accurate. So I'm wondering if we can use that estimated date based on their progress in the program and kind of like what phase they're on rather than their official release date of record. 
Um, I think uh, that might be one that we want to take back. Um, I will say, like, my initial gut reaction is um, as long as there is a reasonable justification for the anticipated release date, um, that that would be acceptable. Um, you know, we do want to make sure, particularly for youth, that they're getting access to the services in that pre-release period. And so if it is likely that they will be released sooner than the date on record, um, then, you know, as long as you're, you know, have some reasonable measure of confidence, then I think that would be okay. But this might be one that we just want to take back and verify um, internally and, and circle back with you. Anybody else have thoughts on that? No. Okay. All right. Last question before we go back to the session, Renee Smith. Hi, uh, Renee Smith with Solano County. And so my question is kind of about, it's for the group as much as it is for you, which is the, the you know, the pausing, the restart, reset. Obviously that has to be tracked in some way. And I'm wondering if any counties out there have developed some kind of system within their EHR that allows for those things to be tracked and then easily come back online you know, when things are um, reset or restarted in order to start the billing process again? Uh, I know that we're going to have a chance in breakout sessions to have uh, regional community peers like come together uh, based on the counties in your region and talk about um, kind of your, what you're thinking about, and that might be a really good question uh, for your breakout sessions today. And I would encourage, you know, across the breakout sessions for folks to um, to bring that question back to the conversation in the breakout rooms about, you know, how are you thinking about tracking this information? I think that's a really good and important question. Um, we don't obviously have the answers to that, so I do suggest we bring that into the breakouts and have folks respond um, in your regions. And then we'll share back some of what we hear uh, from the breakout sessions about how counties are thinking about that. Thank you. All right. Okay, well, thanks everybody. We are going to uh, get a little bit more into our short-term model. Um, we've shared this information previously, but want to walk through some of these scenarios, and then we'll hear from our panel um, who will talk to us about their October go live and um, kind of what they're thinking in some of these areas. So we will, uh, on the next page, just kind of a little bit of an overview, um, you know, a little bit to the point of the conversation we were just having in the Q&A. Um, we, we know that many individuals in county jails have unknown release dates um, at the time of incarceration, that a majority of individuals who uh, matriculate through county jails have an average length of stay of less than 30 days with a large percentage of those um, are in and out of county correctional facilities within 48 hours. We know that for very short term stays, uh, like those that are, you know, 48, 72, 96 hours, um, it'll be uh, complicated to implement some of these requirements. Um, and so what we've done as part of our guidance is develop a short-term model that will um, provide a timeline when there, uh, when expectations for when the correctional facility should start providing pre-release services will kick in for individuals with unknown release dates. Um, we'll also identify like some best practice periods and uh, and hope to kind of help you think through like what can be accomplished for individuals who have um, those really short term stays. So this is meant to provide some flexibility, identify some guidelines for short term stays. And then part of today's session in the breakouts, we want to hear from you about kind of what are you thinking about how to manage um, the implementation of this initiative and pre-release services for, uh, for individuals with short-term stays in the correctional facility. Uh, next. Some of the, um, 
you know, the policy and operations guide that we issued last year, we're in the process of updating, um, lays out specific recommended timelines that are best practices for when we think those services should be uh, should be started uh, for individuals. Um, and it all of the timelines um, are uh, associated with the first seven days of the JI aid code activation. Um, so not necessarily at booking, but like if day one would be the first day that the JI aid code is activated, J day two will be the second day after the JI aid code is activated. So that's our anchor point. It's not necessarily at booking or intake, but at, uh, on the date at which the JI aid code is activated, um, kind of what's happening in the correctional facility setting. That being said, it, you know, when it is appropriate and that screening has happened, there are people who have needs immediately. And if it is appropriate to activate the aid code on the first day of their stay in the correctional facility, then that would be the date that the J GI aid code would be activated for. And so, but we just wanted to kind of orient you to the timeframes in terms of what we previously published in, um, in the short-term model um, overview in the policy and operations guide. Um, so we we know that there are some challenges and we really want to continue to uh, work on the, the policy to make sure that we're providing flexibility while still kind of maintaining within the guidelines of what's expected um, under the 1115 waiver and the um, CMS guidelines issued in the state Medicaid director's letter. Next. So this is the overview in terms of the time frame for the model. Um, we do, uh, you know, want to make sure that um, that the you know first step um, making you know checking for the eligibility of the member, um, you know, determining if they are already enrolled in Medi-Cal or assisting the member with the Medi-Cal application process. Um, on the first day, and again, the first day relates to the date of the JI activation, but these are screenings that happen, you know, as soon as possible for individuals uh, within the uh, within the booking and intake process, and so we want to make sure that at a minimum, folks are getting enrolled in the Medi-Cal program uh, whenever possible, and that you're activating the JI aid code for any pre-release services that might be delivered during that pre-release period. Everything else that you see in green um, are really our best practice guidelines on what we think are the best practices for the provision of pre-release services during that first week after the aid code has been activated. So, uh, uh, you know, any medications or medication administration that the individual might need, maybe they come in with a heart condition or hypertension or diabetes and you need to administer medications to address those conditions or with a substance use disorder, um, um, uh, you know, including MAT treatment or medications for addiction treatment. Uh, we want to make sure that you're uh, providing necessary medications on the first day of the activation of the aid code um, as a best practice whenever possible. On the second day, we want you to start thinking about a care manager who will help with the transition for that individual back into the community and start working with that individual to develop the relationship and help guide them through pre-release services and the re-entry plan. Um, during this process, then you see at the bottom, that also means that the care manager would be engaged in making that connection to the post-release care manager with the ECM provider, uh, doing a warm handoff when appropriate, starting to orient the member to the um, to the ECM program and kind of what will happen uh, with them, you know, for them post-release, um, as well as providing necessary behavioral health links to our county behavioral health agencies for individuals who meet criteria for specialty mental health services, drug medical or drug medical organized delivery system services. So we really want folks with serious mental illness. Um, or, or with a substance use disorder to get connected to their county behavioral health agency in those early days uh, whenever possible so that they can be set up for success upon reentry. We also want to make sure that 
uh, that the medications um, are provided upon release for individuals um, who are um, incarcerated um, after the aid code is activated for at least 48 hours, um, and that there's a provision of uh, DME upon release after uh, for individuals who've been incarcerated for at least 14 days. On the next page, you get into like after that first week where it's really best practice guidelines, you, you would get into more of the expectations starting on day eight of the other things that we would expect for you to do and document in the individual's medical record. For example, we would expect by day eight for an embedded provider or day 10 for an inreach provider to complete a health risk assessment. That's a comprehensive health risk screening assessment that will determine the health care needs, including the mental health and SUD needs for the individual. And by day 14, starting to develop that reentry care plan that was started by the care manager uh, on the second day, uh, ideally in the best practice timeline. Um, by day 21, we would also expect you to start providing any other services. So maybe the individual needs treatment for their diabetes that they started to get medication uh, for earlier, but you need to work on diabetes management and you're providing some clinical consultation to the individual for the purposes of diabetes management. Or maybe you want to order some laboratory or radiology services based on the indicators that came up as part of the health risk assessment, or even um, the provision of community health worker services, which can only be provided by in-reach community-based providers, but we know that it is critically important uh, to involve individuals with lived experience um, in the reentry process for uh, for individuals who are um, who are being released from the carceral setting, and so really getting that individual connected to somebody who's had that similar experience will help to it, it improve their engagement with medical services, improve their engagement with enhanced care management services post release, and just make sure that they're more compliant with their uh, with their medical protocols um, across the board. And again, the continuation in this period of the care management activities and behavioral health linkages, as well as provision of medications upon release in DME. On the next page, we'll start to walk through a bit of a scenario for the short-term model. So in this scenario, we're talking about um, a an individual named Maria um, who has um, hypertension as part of her known medical history. She's um, uh, arrested and booked into the county jail. Um, and during the pretrial period, um, it's determined that Maria is already enrolled in the Medi-Cal program and active with a managed care plan. The correctional facility would turn the JI aid code on at intake um, and would begin to provide services to treat Maria's hypertension, um, as well as um, indicate in the portal, you know, the incarceration date, the release date, if known in this case, we don't know when she's going to be released because it's uh, pre-adjudication, um, as well as the healthcare needs access criteria, which is that she has a chronic condition. Um, in this example, uh, which is just one of the options, the correctional facility is using an in-reach model, and the timeline for that would follow what we just kind of walked through in the chart on the prior pages. Um, going into a little bit more detail on how this would play out from a timeline perspective. So, per, you know, assuming that Maria is booked into the jail um, on July 29th, um, the correctional facility staff will verify Maria's Medi-Cal enrollment, confirm that she's enrolled. They'll provide, uh, they'll do a screening um, and enter that information into the screening portal on that day. Um, and activate the aid code on that day to start pre-release services. Then um, continuing on July 29th, the staff would review Maria's medical records uh, uh, or review her records from her prior incarceration um, and, um, and, and um, you know, through the screening process, um, determined that Maria was diagnosed with hypertension and had been prescribed medications to treat the hypertension. Maria confirms that that 
um, is still the case and that the needs haven't changed. Um, and then um, the correctional facility will check to make sure that the medication is available at the community Medi-Cal enrolled pharmacy and is aligned with the Medi-Cal Rx drug list. Um, and then within 24 hours of the JI aid code activation, the correctional facility staff would prescribe Maria the supply of the medication that's needed to treat her hypertension and the drug would be uh, provided um, to Maria for her stay as well as, um, you know, made available to her upon release. And then on the next page, um, you see within two business days of the JI aid code activation, the correctional facility staff would contact the JI liaison at Maria's assigned managed care plan to get a pre-release ECM provider assigned um, and start to make that connection and do the warm handoff with that ECM provider while Maria is still incarcerated whenever possible. And the um, uh, correctional facility staff would um, you know, really work to schedule an appointment with the ECM provider, uh, make sure that the health risk assessment is completed, and work with that ECM provider to develop a reentry care plan. Then on August 1st, Maria gets released after 72 hours. Um, during her short stay, because she was released uh, before she was able to meet with the ECM provider, um, the correctional facility will give her a flyer and information about the ECM program, um, including the information about her ECM provider and who she should connect with or who will connect with her upon release. They will provide Maria with a full supply of the medications that she needs, as well as any DME that she might need, um, and document the release date in the JI screening portal. And then DHCS would remove the um, aid code um, and uh, Maria's full scope Medi-Cal would be activated at that point. Then the final steps for this particular scenario, within 24 hours of Maria's release, the correctional facility staff would reach out to the ECM provider to notify them um, that Maria was released back into the community. And then the ECM provider would be responsible for engaging with Maria in the community and to continue to facilitate the reentry care plan at that point. Um, so uh, hopefully this model and the timeline scenario that we shared with you gives you a better idea of kind of what our thinking is and how this might work. We know that that won't work in every single case. We know that in some cases it'll be a little bit of a longer timeline, but we wanted to illustrate what we think is the best practice for uh, for provision of services during that period and uh, to really start to highlight and have conversations about, you know, what that could look like for very short term stays. And I think with that, we are going to um, we're going to continue to talk about the short term model in the breakout sessions, and we are going to encourage you to talk to each other about the scenario or about what you're thinking or, um, you know, that's just one scenario. So what are other scenarios that, you know, you want um, to think through with your peer colleagues from other counties? Um, and that'll be part of what we can talk about during the breakout sessions. But today, now we want to introduce our speakers. Uh, we'll let them kind of give their background, but uh, we have Santa Clara County joining us and uh, Michelle De La Colle from the Office of System Integration and Transformation at Santa Clara County will be joining us as well as members of, uh, of the Calim uh, JI Implementation Team from Santa Clara County, May, Amelia, and Fatima. And then from Yuba County, we have Stephanie Lucio, who's a project manager um, for the JI initiative for Yuba County. We also have James Morales from the probation office in Yuba County joining us for today's presentation. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today. Are you all there? Maybe you I'm, can come off mute. I'm here. Turn, turn your cameras on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so maybe we can just get started with uh, an easy question for our discussion today. I might help 
for um, those of us who are participating to better understand how your counties are organized in terms of the delivery of correctional health care services. So maybe, Michelle, we can start with you and then we'll go over to um, the Yuba County folks. Sure. So Michelle Delacay from the um, health system. Our health system does provide um, the county owned health system does provide the services in our four correctional facilities, two for adult and two for youth. Um, we have about uh, 3000 um, daily census and we average about 100 um, uh, ins and outs per uh, 100 ins, 100 outs per day. Um, we have um, some in reach behavioral health providers um, for our collaborative courts and for our juvenile populations, but the other is primarily county staff. And then we are Epic based for our medical care. Our county behavioral health uses Avatar. Um, and I think that uh, is general. We are um, planning to go live with an embedded model I'm using county staff primarily to provide most of those services in the pre-release period. And I will also add that about 90% of our admissions to county facilities are released within the first 90 days of their stay. So a high um, short-term model um, currently and about 90% also are with an unknown release date. Thank you, so Michelle. That a picture, I hope. Yeah, super helpful. Um, Stephanie? Hi, everyone. So uh, Yuba County is a rural Northern California County. We have a population of about 83,000 people. We have one county jail with an ADP of about 350. We have one youth detention center, um, which is actually Tri-County. It serves Yuba, Sutter, and Calusa counties um, with an ADP of about 40 juvenile detainees. Our uh, embedded Correctional health is provided by WellPath, who provides medical and behavioral health services. And our county behavioral health also provides uh, embedded behavioral health services at the detention center. The jail is overseen by our sheriff's department and the Tri-County Youth Detention Center is overseen by probation. Um, we also have support in this initiative through our health and human services department, which is a super agency. And so they provide support through um, our public health division and our eligibility division. And we're also working closely with uh, Sutter Yuba Behavioral Health, which is a bi-county behavioral health agency, physically located in Sutter County, but provides services to both Yuba and Sutter County. All right, thank you. Um, maybe um, Stephanie and James, uh, we'll start with you and you can tell us about, you know, as you're preparing to go live in Yuba County, how are you thinking about implementing the short-term model? So when we're looking at the short-term model, the biggest thing that we're looking at is providing the most services that we can in the shortest period of time, um, whatever that looks like for the period of time that they're incarcerated or detained. Um, so a key part of that process is we have an embedded eligibility technician provided through our health and human services department. Um, that staff is providing services to both the jail and the detention center. Um, they're on site at the jail Monday through Friday to help with uh, screening for eligibility for everyone that's booked and supporting enrollment in Medi-Cal for those that are qualified. Um, at the detention center, they receive uh, secure email transmissions because our ADP is a lot smaller. So they receive those emails and do the same thing, scre screening for eligibility and then coordinating with the parent or guardian to support enrollment in Medi-Cal. Um, that's the key piece that we really want to make sure once they're booked into the jail, as soon as possible, they're screened for Medi-Cal to then start receiving those pre-release services if, if we can activate that JI aid code um, as quickly as possible. Great. James, anything to add on your end? Uh, no, Stephanie um, covered it all. Okay. Great. So then, Michelle, we'll go back to you. How is Santa Clara thinking about this short-term model? So in general, around the whole, most of our work is going to be in a short-term model. So um, we're kind of looking at the big picture and saying, as one county, how can we decrease the silos, increase the communication, increase the collaboration so that we can better um, prioritize early intervention? 
early screening and application support, um, as well as um, better understanding when people might be released. We feel like that's a super um, important factor when we're thinking about that short-term model. Um, we have that higher, higher census, so we're gonna be doing screening electronically in our health record. We, like San Francisco, use EPIC. So we've developed a way to screen for Medi-Cal eligibility um, on admission and then um, asking who would like support in that application process and then going through that process for those that don't have um, Medi-Cal or we don't have enough information to get that, that information. So starting that process early. Um, we, because we use EPIC, we do have a lot of really rich information to help us identify those um, that are eligible. Um, I'll be honest that the portal is um, a little bit one of our, our our challenges. So just making sure that we have the the support and the and the um, people power to really um, manually enter information into the portal and understand um, understand that. So we're um, that's one of our areas where we're going to be hoping to streamline that as soon as possible so that we can better understand who might be eligible and, and get them in. Um, I have a follow-up question there. Are you all sure. using uh, your PATH uh, dollar award for, um, for kind of building up some of the capacity needed to manage this program? I know we didn't talk about this question in advance. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we did just get our um, PATH, uh, our implementation plan approved. Um, a lot of that is around space um, and support and some of that manual support that we're going to have to do um, to really streamline the processes. Um, yeah, and then we're we're piloting some stuff. So we're really trying to figure out um, how can we um, make a better guess about when somebody might leave based on the information that we have available. So um, those are some of the ways that we're approaching, approaching that. And yeah, we did try to um, maximize the reimbursement for some of those questions that are lingering on on those components, but a lot of that's going towards our health link or our, our epic build. And one of the team members that's been fundamental in this process has been Fatima, who's on our team, who who is part of that um, epic design um, team. So she's a consultant that's been working with us and really helping us leverage our our medical record to help us um, be more successful in this in this short term model and in the in the whole implementation. Okay. Um, what other considerations do you think might be important for other county correctional facility folks um, as they're preparing to go live and preparing for implementation? I think the one thing that has helped me stay kind of calm is remember remembering the scope. So really thinking about, okay, we have 40% of our people that leave within 24 hours. I don't know that we're going to be able to do a lot for 40% of those people. So really thinking that that decreases the scope when you think about the huge amount of volume that goes through every day. So for me, it's really been about, okay, what, how do we scope this to something that's manageable versus feeling overwhelmed by the enormous scope of the work? Um, and then really reading into details about the requirements also. So like the meds in hand requirement is incredibly um, intimidating. Um, I'll be, uh, you know, is, is incredibly intimidating when you read all. But if you read, if you read it, it's all who have had the JI um, marker for at least 48 hours. So that feels like, okay, now I don't know how many that will be, but I know it won't be 100% of, of our full population all the time. And then trying to do some bite-sized reviews to really understand what does that really look like to operationalize that. So doing pilots and, and, and really thinking critically about who, who already touches that patient. How can we get information? Um, how do we incorporate all these different teams um, together to really get a sense of who this patient is and how can we best serve them in the limited time that we have and then ensure that there's that follow-up after. So that's how we've kind of approached it. And I think just really remembering that 
there is work that we can do. And how do we find the right work? Um, and how do we operationalize the right work for the population and the scope um, that's in this in this um, proposal? Great, thank you. Uh, super helpful um, from from our perspective, anyway. Um, Stephanie and James, uh, same question to you. What are other factors or considerations that you that you've learned, like that you've learned based on what you've been working on towards implementation, that you think it's important for your colleagues from across the state to know? Something that really helped us out in Yuba County in planning for implementation was um, development of a steering committee. And so that really helped in bringing the key players all to the table at the same time. So the correctional facilities don't need to be the expert in all areas, right? You have partners who are experts in behavioral health. You have experts that are, um, you have partners that are experts in eligibility and medic health. So bringing them to the table and offloading that from the correctional facilities, but discussing it in a group setting so that people are familiar with the requirements was really helpful. So we started that steering committee in January um, in preparation for planning to go live in October. Through that process for re-entry planning for both the short-term and for longer-term stays, we developed a multidisciplinary team approach to re-entry planning. Again, bringing the key partners to the table that are gonna have a hand in re-entry planning to do it collaboratively rather than in silos. So for example, we have a facilitation through myself as a project manager, We'll have our sheriff's department, probation department, Wellpath as the clinical medical and behavioral health provider. Um, we're using a local FQHC that we acquired through a competitive RFP process as the in-reach provider. Um, Yuba Center Behavioral Health and ad hoc will bring in our managed care plans to support re-entry planning um, for those that are exiting the facilities. Thank you. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes left. Um, anything else that you all want to share? Um, right, you know, we're, as you're on the precipice of of going live with this initiative, maybe Stephanie, we'll start with you. Um, I think one thing to share is um, when we did our RFP for the inReach provider, a uh, key thing that we really wanted to have as a eligibility requirement was that they're also a post-release ECM provider. So it allows us a closed loop process. So while the individual is um, detained or in custody, um, they'll provide case management. And then post-release, they can also be the ECM provider if the individual chooses to continue with them or um, if they don't have an ECM provider already, um, they can join with them as the ECM provider. Um, and then those that are very short-term stays where we just can't capture that re-entry planning process, we do have that ECM flyer that we are putting with their belongings along with like the Narcan. And so that way, um, if they don't establish contact while they're in the facilities, um, the individuals will understand like that the in-reach provider can contact them post-release to help facilitate case management um, if they need or want that. All right, great. Michelle, anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I think um, a lot of our, just thinking about the after hour discharges and those kind of components and that short turnaround time from the court release to the same day release um, or the early morning, you know, the midnight 1, 1 a.m. releases. Um, really thinking critically about how to do something to help understand that population and help get them what they need at release. So that med in hand kind of component. Um, so, you know, we're, we're kind of developing a little bit of a strike team and trying to figure out how to, how to make sure that that, that isn't missed because that is, I think one of the most complicated components is that that nighttime release that, you know, they released on the 5th, so they were released at 1 a.m. Um, those kind of things are are a lot more um, difficult to operationalize than, than we think. So we're piloting and doing some of those things that I think are really helping us learn more about those gaps and how to, how to close them operationally. 
So a question just came in the chat that I think is similar to that about, you know, what ideas you've come up with regarding the lack of release dates. Um, it sounds like what you all are doing to kind of tackle this issue is testing um, and seeing what strategies really work. And then um, from that learning, assuming that you'll move forward with what works and not with things that don't work, you want to talk a little bit about your testing strategy? Yeah, so um, we just tested yesterday in Meds in Hand and we went just like, who's going to court tomorrow? So we pulled a bunch of people who are going to court and we prepped their meds and we got them over to the, the station to where they were going to be released. Um, and we had them in a 9-4 list, um, but they were actually released 9-5, but at 1 a.m. And so we missed them, right? And so so just like, like really thinking those things through and then, so now today I'm really focused on understanding from the probably, uh, no, the um, public defender's office. Like sometimes they know what court dates might end up with a release or what, and how can we bring them into a care conferencing model like Stephanie talked about for a subpopulation or for a group that we have that release on to be able to have a different kind of conversation about, look, we we all have the best interest of this of this individual, how can we bring that together? So um, shifting from just basic court dates to specified court dates or different um, levels, because I think there's there's a lot to learn from these groups and how do we cluster folks together so that we can get the best information or best um, guess on that. And, and what's the threshold for saying yes, even though it's not 100%, um, 100% is in the goal, is 50% good. Um, and so really thinking about those things to get those meds ready for those folks that are releasing, I think it's going to be, it's, it's going to be hard. So we're working with PDO, we're working with the um, sheriff's office, the rehab officers that work with the patients on discharge planning, the reentry center, the courts in terms of dates of, of, of court appearances, and also just, and the patient, sometimes the patient has been told when they think they'll be release, but it's not an official release date. So those are the the approaches we're taking on, on trying to figure out the release date. Yeah, and then the, I think room. that's great. I think there's so much richness in there in terms of what you all are, are trying to do there. And I think sharing it with this larger group is, um, is incredibly helpful. I think as people are thinking about how they move forward, I really like the idea of of kind of using a, a testing approach to figure out what works and involving different partners and figuring out like trying it, see what you missed, what didn't work. I think that's really great. Um, and definitely something I think for others to think about. I know Mike's had his hand up for a while. He just added his question to the Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask it here. Um, uh, the the question from uh, from Mike in the Q&A for, is for Yuba County. They want, to, uh, he wants to know how you're handling enrollment when the embedded provider uh, is not on site or when that the embedded um, person responsible is not on site? Well, that's a great question. Um, our embedded eligibility technician is only on site Monday through Friday. They have a normal working schedule. And so they come in uh, double on Monday to kind of pick up the weekend slack. Um, so we understand that we might be missing some of those short-term stays over the weekend, trying to capture, um, again, providing as much services as we can on Monday with um, uh, verifying eligibility um, and so providing support if they're still in custody, activating the GIA code if they're still in custody so they can start receiving those 90-day uh, pre-release services. Right. Um, and then uh, there's a, I think there's a couple of other questions. We'll make sure that we get these over to you. Uh, we just wanted to say really appreciate you all coming and sharing your learnings to date. I think we're, you know, we're all in this together and trying to figure out how to make this work. Um, and as the first brave counties to go live in October, um, I think you'll really help to shed a light on what implementation is really going to take for uh, for your county colleagues across the state and um, and for us at DHCS too. Just really um, insightful to hear from you all and appreciate your willingness to come and be a part of this 
learning collaborative session. Uh, we are going to move into our breakout so we can start to hear from other counties about what it is that you um, uh, are thinking about, uh, about the short-term model. Did, did this conversation uh, with Santa Clara and Yuba County, and again, just thank you so much to Michelle and Stephanie and James and all of you for being here. Um, did this conversation spark any thinking for you? Um, what have you been thinking about in terms of short-term model implementation? Are you thinking about testing different strategies for um, unknown release dates? Like those are all really good questions that we'd love to have you, um, you know, talk about with your peers in the breakout sessions. So we have um, smaller groups based on regions. Um, this space is really meant to be for county correctional facility partners um, and may include county behavioral health agencies and MCPs from that area, but we, we'd really like to keep this space for those folks, the county correctional facility partners, county behavioral health agencies and MCPs um, in terms of the short-term model and ask other types of participants, including community-based providers, to exit the call at this time. Again, we're trying to hold space for different types of stakeholders per the recommendations from this group on our last meeting. There will be an office hour session uh, coming up for folks to participate in in two weeks. There will be a more general open forum session. Uh, next week will be for our county partners uh, to come together, but we wanna hold space for these breakouts. And this particular discussion, which seems particularly pertinent to our county partners um, in this space for our county partners to share and learn from each other. Um, on the next slide, um, you'll see the room sessions that we'd like you to join. So just like last time, um, please go to the breakouts tab and find the room um, that you've been assigned to. If you don't see your county listed or you're not sure where to go, it won't really hurt for you to go to a different room. Um, but we did want to, um, you know, try to bring folks together um, you know, regionally so that you can learn from colleagues that are in your area. But again, it won't hurt if you end up joining a different room. So please go to the breakout rooms and you'll join uh, the room that fits your county or organization the best. We've made some suggestions here and we will join you there in a moment. We'll have folks who are going to hang back and who will help facilitate it if you don't know how to find your room. But um, but we'd like you to start moving into the breakout rooms now. And on the next slide, there's just that kind of technical assistance about how to join the breakout room. We'll put the breakout rooms back up in just a moment. But if you find the breakout room uh, panel on the control panel at the bottom of your screen, you click on that and then select the specific room uh, by kind of scrolling down to the rooms listed and click join for the room that you would like to join. And then we'll go back up to the um, to the prior slide that shows you which room we're recommending that you go to. All right, we'll see you in the breakouts in just a moment. Hey, welcome back everybody. I know we still have some folks who are coming back in from breakout sessions. So we'll give folks just another um, few seconds I know when we left our breakout room, we had about 30, 45 seconds left. So lots of people coming back in now. The breakout rooms must have closed. We'll give it just a moment before we wrap up and talk about next steps. All right. Well, hopefully you found the conversations in your breakout rooms helpful. Um, I know our breakout room was uh, a great discussion. We had some really good conversation about partnerships um, across implementing partners in Imperial County. We also heard um, from Orange County about some of the work that they're doing to test the connection with ECM services for their short-term population. Really interesting insights there as well. I'm sure that there were interesting insights from all of the rooms and we'll think about how we can capture some of those and share them out 
broadly so that folks have a little bit more visibility into what your county colleagues across the state are thinking about um, in terms of implementing this program. So just as a reminder, on the next slide, you'll see the timeline again. We talked about this at the beginning at length, but next week, we will have a, next slide please, uh, we will have a correctional facility uh, county partner specific office hour session. If you take away from today and think about um, all of the you know learnings from today and you have questions, uh, we encourage you to come to that office hour session and follow up with us. We know that there's a lot of questions for Stephanie and for Michelle. And so we'll also uh, work to get contact information out for Yuba County and Santa Clara County. There will also be a general office hour session on the 19th where everybody's invited to join us um, uh, for an open forum office hour session. Don't forget about the JI screening portal training that's live on 910 and 912, as well as the billing and claiming training that will happen on 917 and 919. And then our next full learning collaborative session will be on September 26th, where we'll dig in a little bit more to Beaver Health Services, including MAT Services, and behavioral health links. So uh, really excited about that. Um, I thought today's session was really great. Uh, it was a wonderful to hear from our county partners. Just wanna again, thank Stephanie and James and Michelle and your teams for joining us, uh, for coming on this journey with us as we implement the reentry initiative starting in October. Um, and for participating in today's session, uh, most of all. So thank you all for everything that you're doing. And for all of you, we know that you're working hard. We know that you have a lot of questions and these learning collaboratives are really meant to help uh, support you. So please feel free to submit questions to our Calum Justice Advisory Group email uh, between now and next week. Join us for the office hours um, and uh, we'll continue to engage with you and support you as we uh, get closer and closer to go live for each of your counties. So thank you all. Um, great session. Appreciate the time that you gave to us today um, and hope that it was helpful. If you have any feedback, please feel free to email us at Cali Aim Justice Advisory Group and we'll continue to strive to make these uh, sessions as meaningful as we can. All right. Have a great day, everybody.